Thank you, Mike, and it's great to be with you today. Um, and as a short introduction of uh, General Petraeus, it's hard to find anyone in the world with this uh, resume, and the fact is there isn't anyone in the world with this resume. Director of the CIA, only person in U.S. Army history to graduate number one from the Ranger School and the Command and General Staff a college course, PhD at Princeton, and many others. Uh, <clears throat> Prime Minister Tony Blair, first Prime Minister to serve two successive terms, leadership role in bringing peace in Northern Ireland, tripled UK's foreign aid to Africa, Blair Institute for Global Change, Blair Africa Governance Initiative, uh, and probably uh, not well known, but we're not going to have a chance today to listen to the guitar uh, when he was in school, <laughs> the Ugly Rumors Band. So he was way ahead of his time uh, when he was going to school uh, from that standpoint. So we're honored to be here today with two individuals who have shaped the world. And we'll spend the next hour talking about the shape of the future of the world. So, Prime Minister, I'd like to start with you, your organization called the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Your aim, aim is to make globalization work for many, not the few. Globalization is not a new phenomenon, though, but do you think there is more that could be done today, and let's take a look at the tendons of that. If we looked at the four objectives of the Institute today. You want to tell us about those four? Yeah. Uh, first of all, Mike, thanks very much for having me here. And it's an it's a immense uh, pleasure not just to be interviewed by you, but to be with uh, General Petraeus. These are two of the people I respect most in the in the world and two of the biggest brains in the world, which um, means that my curriculum vitae um, of having been a guitarist and ugly rumors is not quite the same as the <laughs> stellar academic accomplishments on either side of me. And I always reflect, by the way, that I was extremely, I'm extremely lucky that when I was in a band and had hair down to here and wore some pretty strange clothes and did a very bad impression of Mick Jagger, I. I'm extremely grateful that social media did not exist <laughs> at that moment in time, because otherwise I would not be sitting here. I, <laughs> um, so essentially, all of my, I, I suppose all of my political life, but now since leaving office, I see globalization as a force that, that opens up the world, brings people together, offers enormous opportunities. But because the change is so fast and it's accelerating still, then it causes stresses and strains, and those are of an economic and a cultural nature. So what we work on are the things that, if you like, can hold globalization back from being equitable and accepted. So in governance, in my view, the biggest problem today for poor countries is not so much aid, although we, as you say, we tripled aid when I was in office. It's the quality of governance. Um, it's being able to get things done and to do things in an honest way, but also an effective way. And when I was in office, you know, I, when I first came into office in, in Downing Street, <clears throat> because I was the prime minister, I'd sit at the cabinet table and I'd take a decision. And I kind of thought, if I took the decision, and I must be a pretty powerful person since I'm prime minister, if I took the decision, something happened. <laughs> uh, you know, I learned over time, no, that's not the way government works. I mean, there may be other organizations where like that, not government. So you need processes in place to implement. So Could we you work. just take us back to that day? You were one of the youngest prime ministers. What was it like walking into 10 Downing Street? Well, it was vaguely terrifying because we'd never, we'd been out of power for 18 years. I'd never had a job in government. And uh, actually, um, I walked down the long corridor, the door opened, I walked down the long corridor. Um, and then went into the cabinet room, and there were actually just two chairs like this. The ch and sitting in the other chair was the civil servant who was the chief of the civil service, and that's not a non-political appointment. So he'd been there for a long time, very upper-class English guy. 
And he sort of motioned me to the other seat, so I sat down. And he said in that very British way, he said, well done. <laughs> <clears throat> and then he said, now what? <laughs> And the now what is what I found quite difficult, actually. <laughs> so, anyway, we work in about 14 different countries in Africa, uh, some countries outside that, with teams of people on the ground. So that's governance. Uh, then coexistence. If, if the world turns in a, against itself culturally, or people of different faiths start regarding each other as enemies, that's a big problem. So we have programs in about 30 countries working on how you cultivate the open mind amongst young people, turn them away from extremism, the abuse of religion, and so on. Um, to, towards cultural coexistence. The Middle East is a big part of what I do um, because I believe there is today, for the first time, a real chance of getting an alliance between the Jewish state of Israel and the Arab states of the region. I think it is the key to solving the Palestinian question, but also to a more stable Middle East. And then finally, there's something we've just begun, which is really about if Western politics goes isolationist, nativist, and protectionist at the time when the rest of the world wants to open up, this is going to be a big problem. So how do we overcome the polarization in Western politics today? And how do we ensure that the, the idea of building bridges to those that disagree with you is back in fashion? And my view is a lot of the populism today is born of pessimism about the future. And the key is to reignite optimism, to reignite the prospect of a generational promise where the next generation does better than this. And the key to that is in understanding the technological change that's going to be happening, the changes in life science, in energy, in IT, and how we access their opportunities and prepare for their risks and their displacement. And that is, I think, the central political question of our time. It's not one that occupies a lot of political time, but it certainly should. And I know this is what General Petraeus is working on now. So I think this is, you know, for me, all of these things fit together. And in the end, what I want to see is a world that's open-minded, where we regard globalization as basically a positive, but have to deal with its effects, and where our young people are growing up comfortable across the boundaries of faith and race and nation and color and ethnicity. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. So, <clears throat> I think it's a vision we all share, and with your leadership, uh, and we have a much better chance for it to become a reality. So, General, I'd like to welcome you again, but I'd like to start by reading a passage of what you wrote. A little more, <clears throat> a little more than a century ago, at the dawn of the 20th century, Americans had a reason to be hopeful. The great powers were at peace. Economic independence among nations was increasing. Miraculous new technologies were appearing with dizzying speed. This optimistic view would soon fall to pieces as more people were killed in two war, world wars than at any time in history. To keep the peace, we led an effort to establish a system of global alliances, security commitments underwritten by the US military power and the deployment of our forces and bases in Europe and Asia. To create a foundation for prosperity, we put in place free and rules-based international economic order intended to safeguard against the spiral of protectionism that produced impoverishment and radicalization of the 1930s. And to protect freedom at home, we adopted a foreign policy that sought to protect and, where possible, promote freedom abroad along with human rights and rule of law. These were the bipartisan foundations of international order that emerged after World War II. The extent of success that we have seen in the first half of the, compared to the first half of the 20th century and the second half of the 20th century, a period that witnessed the longest stretch without great power war in centuries, the most dramatic expansion of human prosperity in history, and the spread of democracy around the world. To borrow a phrase, this is the world that America made. What is the world we're seeing in the 21st century, and how does it relate 
to this very important paper you wrote, comparing the first half of the 20th century and the last half of the 20th century. Well, thanks very much. Congratulations on another extraordinary global conference and uh, a privilege to be reunited with a wartime prime minister. Uh, I was fortunate to serve under uh, in a couple of different wars. Look, the, the, the rules-based international order that I wrote about there, which came about in the wake of a 50-year period that had two world wars and the Great Recession, or Great Depression, um, that rules-based international order is now under more stress and strain than at any time since the end of the Cold War. There is a more complex array of challenges uh, and indeed threats out there that face us and our allies and partners around the world. And most significantly, we are once again in an era of great power rivalries. Uh, most of that latter development is a result of the rise, the dramatic and extraordinary and unprecedented uh, growth of a country, China. Uh, and you now have uh, two powers that are indeed the strategic rivals of each other, but who interestingly are also the top trading partners uh, for each other as well. Uh, Graham Allison, <coughs> a professor at Harvard, in fact I'm heading there right after this, uh, wrote about this in a book titled uh, Destined, Destined for, War. for War. And, you know, is can America and China escape Thucydides' trap? It's the Thucydides' trap because this is a chronicler of the Peloponnesian War. Uh, Thucydides writes that you had Sparta here, you had Athens as a rising power, U.S. and China, uh, and he writes, inevitably, they went to war. Uh, Graham Allison studies 16 other cases in more recent uh, centuries, 12 times uh, rising power and established power go to war. And the challenge for us now is to manage this new strategic rivalry, uh, this new era of great power rivalries. It also sees a bit of a resurgence of Russia as Putin strides the world stage and what hopefully is the beginning of the rise of India uh, as well. The world cries out, frankly, for American leadership, and paradoxically, we find a fair number of our fellow citizens uh, and some of those in Washington in very significant places who question whether globalism is all it's cracked up to be, whether continuing to lead the world uh, and the rules-based international order is worth it. Is it really, uh, again, should we continue to expend uh, all the blood and treasure to deploy our military around the world, to uh, consummate further trade deals. All of these are in question, uh, and questioned, I think, in a unique way uh, since the end of the Cold War. My hope and the theme of the piece uh, from which you read the beginning was that the U.S. would continue to lead the rules-based international order together with allies and partners around the world like the U.K., and hopefully in a very managed way uh, with the strategic rival that has emerged, uh, China. In fact, I was in Beijing all last week. Um, but that is the central question of the day, uh, is what this relationship will be, how it can be managed, mm. so that we do indeed avoid the Thucydides trap. So let me switch. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you've talked a lot about China's Belt Road this initiative to travel not just on a road, but on the sea, et cetera, and unite uh, so many nations in a common trading. And, uh, and this is kind of a look here at that, uh, the old Silk Road that used to exist, uh, and then the new you know, Belt Road that we're attempting to create talking about linking 65 countries, 4.4 billion people, and 30% of the world's GDP. Now, it was many years ago, but in the Americas, we did actually build what is a road called the Pan American Highway. And it goes from the tip of Alaska, this highway, to the tip of Chile and Argentina. And here it's a billion people. Uh, and at the moment, we need to do a number of things to tell the Americas we are one. 
You know, at the Institute here, we're thinking of having a torch relay, you know, from Alaska to the tip of Chile. But take us back to your views, and I know you've done a great deal of speaking and thinking on this issue over the last four or five years on the Belt and Road Initiative. So One Belt, One Road uh, initiative is hugely important in its own terms, obviously. It's a major infrastructure play right across um, uh, Asia, Central Asia, and, and down into other parts of the world. And it, it's, its economic significance for China and for the countries affected is very obvious. But I think you know, one of the hardest things sometimes in politics, especially when you're in the day-to-day, -day, is to take a step back and look at what, what I call the big picture. And the big picture is exactly as, as, as <coughs> General Petraeus has just been saying. The truth is China is emerging, has emerged as this major power, and this power will grow. And there's, there's an inevitability about that. And by the way, it's, there's a natural um, growth of this power because you're going to have this huge population country it's going to be a major economic power. It's going to become a major political and economic uh, military power as a result of that. And that is a, that, that's a fact, as it were. The question is, how do we deal with it? And how do we deal with it in a way which encourages those forces within China to go towards partnership and cooperation rather than confrontation and com competition? Now, I think for that to happen, ironically, the stronger the West is, the more clear it is in its own thinking and in the values it stands up for, the easier it is that that evolution of China into this major, major power, the single biggest geopolitical change in my children's lifetime, that that happens in a benign way. Because I think we've got to understand today that the West is not just being contested economically because of the rise of China, but I think in a broader sense, our political model in a way is being contested. Very much so, yeah. Now, for the first yep. time, you have a, what you might call a, an authoritarian model of government where people are saying, look, if you want to get things done, you need a strong leader. And that strong leader centers all power in themselves and takes the decisions necessary. So, you know, there's a recent announcement from China. There's what President Putin represents in Russia. You look at Erdogan in Turkey today. You go across the world, you even look at parts of Europe, mm -hmm. what the new prime minister has done in Hungary. You see also a different model of, 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 of government. Now, I think what is therefore important for us, this is the importance of our countries standing together as, as an alliance, not just of interests, but of values, we have to understand our position in the world is going to be contested, not just economically, but politically. So my view is that the, the best way to deal with China, because I spend time in China, I admire <coughs> Chinese civilization, I accept entirely the power that they are going to have, and I hope and believe that it will evolve in a benign way. But I think it's much more likely to evolve in a benign way if we are strong and clear. And that's why, you know, what I would like to see and, and see quite urgently is for us to recognize that at the same time as we deal with some of these problems within our own societies, we recognize that what the Western countries stand for, democracy, rule of law, you know, independent media, these essential freedoms, these are things that we are going to have to stand up for in a very disciplined, uniform, and united way in order that the 21st century handles this change of power, but handles it in a way that sees those values that I think are universal human values emerge triumphant. So General, before I go to you, I wanna put one more fact in your thinking. So over the decades, China's population eventually will be reduced by a few hundred million here, as for sure India rises up to be the most populous nation they have had dramatic changes under Modi, the movement in technology, the identification of 1.3 billion people. And tell us how that would play into the equation, the rise of what will be the most populous nation in the world in India at the same time these discussions go on. 
Well, it really depends on how well India does uh, in truly achieving its own greatness. Uh, can it come even close to doing what China did? You know, what China did is something no other country has ever done in history, it, which is two decades straight of year-on-year double-digit GDP growth. Now, it's finally no longer that. Now it's a little under 7% per year, which is still quite extraordinary for the now number two economy uh, in the world. Um, so it really depends how well does India do? Is this the Modi moment? Uh, what does it amount to be? Can this famously ungovernable uh, bureaucratic uh, country in South Asia, can it replicate what China has done? But I want to underscore something the Prime Minister said. Uh, this is that there is a new, not just great power rivalry, it's a rivalry of systems. Uh, you may recall, many of you, in 1989, there was a famous article by Francis Fukuyama. It was titled, The End of History. And essentially what he was saying is that with the end of the Cold War and the wall comes down and, and all the rest of this, um, what has happened is that history, which he defined as sort of this Hegelian dialectic, this competition of ideas between the Soviet system, essentially, the Eastern communist system, and that of the West, uh, led by the U.S., that competition, that debate is ended. History is over. So you have the end of history. Well, history is back. Uh, and it came back somewhere, you know, in the last decade or so. And there is a new dialectic ongoing. It's a new competition of ideas between the uh, system that is represented by a much more authoritarian uh, government, uh, which allows certainly, though, a capitalist economy to flourish within uh, certain bounds against the system of the U.S. and, and the West, again, uh, the liberties and freedoms and so forth that we all cherish. But the fact is this other system is doing really quite extraordinarily well. And many around the world uh, who are facing term limits or what have you in other places are going to say, you know, maybe the way they're doing it is not bad. And of course, President Xi of China no longer has term limits. Uh, perhaps that kind of strongman rule is what's really needed in these fractious countries uh, that they may be leading. Uh, so the West has got to get its act together. Uh, paradoxically, I was at the Munich Security Conference uh, a couple of months ago, uh, and I thought about the fact that this conference used to be a NATO conference, now it's global. Uh, the major five nations of NATO, four, had some degree of domestic political challenge. The UK with Brexit, Germany at that time was trying to form a government. They have now done that, but it was a very narrow run thing for Chancellor Merkel. Uh, Italy was facing an election which turned out to be even less clear in outcome and may have to have another election. And the U.S. has a degree of domestic populism and hyperpartisanship uh, that is preventing us from turning legislative, regulatory, and policy headwinds into tailwinds to capitalize on the extraordinary opportunities that we have. Interestingly, the country that was the standout at that moment, this is a couple of months ago, is, of course, France with President Macron, a visionary leader who's pushing that country forward. We'll see how far that can go. But that is what is competing with the extraordinary results that have been achieved by the system in China. So before we leave Asia and travel to, to Europe, as we're about to travel around the world, uh, I'd like to give you a quote this morning from the president of South Korea. The president of South Korea said today that President Donald Trump deserves a Nobel Prize for bringing North and South Korea together. <laughs> Where do we stand with the North Korean situation? Uh, and will the North uh, denuclearize? Obviously, General, this is something you've focused on specifically yeah. for a long time. Well, look, we have had agreements very similar to what we seem to have read uh, between the North and South Korean leaders uh, all the way back to 1992. Three successive American presidents have had uh, agreements on denuclearization. Uh, three South Korean presidents have been part of that, and interestingly, three North Korean leaders as well. Um, now, this current administration, and we heard it yesterday from Secretary of State Pompeo and the new National Security Advisor John Bolton said they are keenly aware of the history that there were agreements made and repeatedly broken. 
Uh, they say they're going into this with their eyes wide open, uh, that the only acceptable outcome is the complete, uh, irreversible, and verifiable denuclearization of uh, the Korean Peninsula. Uh, but again, time will tell. So, you know, it's a great thought. Hold that thought for now uh, until the moment that this complete, irretrievable, and, 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 uh, and verifiable uh, denuclearization is complete. Prime Minister, what are your thoughts on the South Korean uh, uh, president's uh, suggestion? Well, I think probably the, there are members of the Nobel Peace Prize Committee currently in therapy, but um, <laughs> uh, they, <laughs> sort of wondering how they're going to handle this. But, um, but you know, my, my, my view is uh, this is this is an extraordinary situation, and if it works, it works. So you know, let's let's hope that it does, and, and sometimes actually unpredictability um, as a characteristic can turn into a strategy. And give some... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, moving on. <laughs> you know, we often um, think, and I've spoken many times about how Soviet Union thought 1957 and Sputnik was their crowning achievement. At the height of the center of the Cold War, that that their system was more advanced than ours. And my views were this was really the end, the day the Soviet Union ended. Because it woke up the United States, NASA was formed, DARPA was formed, and at the end, uh, Russia could not compete, the Soviet Union could not compete economically with an arms race. If we look at the size of Russia today, which is substantially smaller than it was at the peak, and compare it to California, for example, California looks awful small uh, compared to Russia. But if we adjust our maps based on economics, we can see that Russia looks relatively small compared to California, and Russia's economy is the size of a couple states, Georgia, New Jersey, uh, in this case, and Massachusetts. And so as we think about economics, when we think about uh, the United States and we think about, okay, who discovered North America and Columbus and who finance Columbus, we learn about Queen Isabella and the fact that it took a sovereign to finance the discovery of what occurred to be North America. But the transfer of power from Europe to, no, from Southern to Northern Europe with the start of the stock market uh, in Amsterdam and the creation of a stock company, the Dutch East Company and the West Company, spread this concept around the world of access to capital, multiple sources of risk taking, and really Southern Europe never really recovered in competition with the sharing of risk. And I want to, as we move on to Europe here in Russia, I'd like to just show you a short clip from Jim Kim, head of the World Bank from last year, 2017 Global Conference, when he's telling the Archbishop, that he wants to apologize to the Pope because he thinks he has sinned. Let's take a look at that clip. I was with, um, uh, uh, with a group that we work with, a faith-based faith uh, uh, organizations, and um, uh, I was telling them about how important finance is, about how important it is to crowd in capital, about how uh, the, the, the tremendous potential of, uh, of uh, creative finance to solve the problem of poverty in the world. And, you know, the, some of the faith-based uh, organizations just push back and say, you know, when you talk about swaps and hedges, uh, we just are, are we, go to, we go to sleep. And here's what I said, because the archbishop representing the Vatican to the, uh, to the UN and the World Bank was there. And I said, you know, archbishop, with great respect, and, uh, you know, I, I admire the Pope so much. But I would say this. I would say that for me, my first 25 years of working in development, I didn't know anything about finance. And the last five, um, I've been steeped in it, right? And I said, and, and I want to please tell the Pope this. I think that my ignorance of finance in the first 25 years was actually sinful. 
because there's no way that we're going to be able to lift everywhere, everyone out of extreme poverty unless we get much more creative about how we use the capital in the world to create good outcomes. Okay, so many people in the audience think it's sinful that most of our government doesn't understand uh, finance, but we're working on it. Uh, <laughs> let's take a look at Europe and Russia, really in two parts. One, Prime Minister of Brexit. What is it going to mean to the UK and Europe? Uh, will there be a European Union in the future? And the second area, um, General, what does Russia want uh, from that standpoint? Who wants to go first? Okay. <laughs> Always defer to the policymaker if you're a military man. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is no, the sure, check and life. balance of Western governments where the military <laughs> reports to the political leader. I, actually, I do have one observation to share. Uh, <laughs> uh, as a partner now in the global financial investment firm KKR, I have come to realize that beyond government service, the highest calling of mankind is the private equity industry. <laughs> um, well, for a person that graduated first in his class, led our efforts around the world, uh, we appreciate that insight. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to emphasize that with that comes enormous responsibility day for private equity. They control more than 8,000 firms. In the United States today, they're seven of the 10 largest employers. And with that economic power comes enormous responsibility for the jobs of the citizens of, of not only our country, but the countries of the world. So you've taken on a lot more responsibility there, too. Well, and in, and in a serious note, we, no kidding, seriously try to do well while doing good. Uh, both because of, if you will, the moral nature of that, but also, frankly, the practical nature. And for what it's worth, we are actually raising our first impact uh, investment fund where we're going to turn it around and do good while still hopefully doing well. And I will let Henry and George know what a great job you've done <laughs> in outlining that we'll be, mission. we'll be accepting investments outside the door. <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister, let's, let's start with Brexit in Europe and the future yeah. of Europe. No, I was just reflecting, actually, in your exchange. I mean, part of the problem in, in politics is, is it's, you know, it's the one sphere of life where, where you, you, you can do an extraordinarily important job um, with absolutely no qualifications for it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, because you, you, you know, in no other walk of life, I mean, you never say for the, if you're going to have a new coach of the football team, you never say, just give me the most enthusiastic fan. <laughs> but we do this in politics, and one of the things I reflect on, um, <laughs> having, having left office, is just how much enriched your knowledge becomes, uh, you know, once you, you go out in the world and you study and you kind of, well, anyway, uh, you wish yep, that some of that knowledge had been available whilst you were there. So um, on, on Brexit, uh, first of all, the European Union will stay. By the way, there have been people predicting from the very beginning of the European steel and coal community that it wouldn't last. Uh, I had the first British diplomat that attended the first meeting I think wrote back to his superiors saying, you know, jolly interesting meeting, but these chaps will never go anywhere. Um, but, you know, here we are. Um, the European Union, in my view, will stay together uh, because, for a very simple reason, for the reasons we were discussing earlier, in a world in which you're going to have three giants, the United States, India, and China, because GDP and population will become more realigned, you're going to have some very tall people like Indonesia, <clears throat> Philippines, Mexico, Brazil, and so on. And you can have some medium-sized people, which will include Germany, France, UK. Okay. We, in order to exercise power, are going to have to band together collectively. That is the basic rationale for the European Union. After the war, it was peace. Today, it's power. If we want to exercise power, we're going to have to exercise it together. So Europe will stay together. As for Brexit, um, look, I will carry on fighting uh, against it up until the moment it happens because I believe it's a mistake for my country. 
I think it's possible that it doesn't happen because I think the government are going to find it very hard to resolve the issues in the present negotiation and persuade Parliament that they've got a good deal for the future. Um, but if it does happen, we've got to make the most of it. And Britain will remain a great country with a great people um, who are creative and innovative. And you know, we will have to forge a different future for ourselves. But I just wish we were forging it still keeping that strong alliance with the European Union. So, you know, we'll see, but there's no doubt at all, to my mind, the European Union will stay. Um, and the loss of Britain from Europe is not just a bad thing for Britain. I think it is a loss for Europe, mm -hmm. and I think it's a loss for the transatlantic alliance, because we were yeah. always in there arguing the importance of the American relationship. Now. Um, there are others that do that today, in, in, including uh, the new president of France, who I have to say has done brilliantly, and you've got no idea how difficult it is for a British prime minister to say that about a French president. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but, but I do it, um, and uh, felicitation and all of that. Um, <laughs> but you know, even so, uh, the points that were being made earlier about where Europe is at the moment, there's a lot of uncertainty in Europe, and it would be better if we were focused on sorting our problems out together rather than focused on negotiating Brexit. Let's turn to Russia. If we think about, you know, the world over the centuries, I mean, the British Empire, the sun never sat on the British Empire, and the world, one of the things for me is I travel the world and see cemeteries. British cemeteries throughout the world, much of the sacrifice that the UK and Britain has brought to bring the governance systems that you both spoke about to the world today and how they've benefited from those systems. But the world changed. If we look at the Soviet Union uh, and it, how it once spanned the world also, we could understand how they have felt with these countries spun out of that. What does Putin want? Where does Russia go, General? Well, Putin truly believes what he said, that the worst day of the last century was when the Soviet Union dissolved. Uh, and what he wants, essentially, is to reassemble as much of the Soviet Union uh, as he can and to stride the world stage once again uh, as the leader of a great power, and he's doing the best he can to do that, uh, albeit with a much smaller country, a uh, demographic decline, a uh, decline, of course, in the price of his major exports, uh, oil and natural gas. Um, but he is playing that challenged hand uh, quite impressively, at least tactically. Uh, he's invaded a couple of countries, of course, uh, that used to be part of the uh, Russian republics of the Soviet Union. Uh, he's intimidated others. Uh, he's been the greatest gift to NATO since the end of the Cold War. Uh, nothing has given NATO a reason to live again, uh, as Vladimir Putin has. Um, so that's what's going on. Uh, and he particularly enjoys if he can both stride the world stage and poke the U.S. in the eye, uh, which is, of course, why he also tried to undermine our democracy uh, by what they did in social media, and then put a scale on finger on the scale of the elections and sought to do the same uh, in other cases, including uh, in the case of the Brexit decision. So as we think about the strategy, what should our response be? What is the best response to Putin and the Russia today? Well, a lot of this, to put it very simplistically, it's to be firm but not provocative. And I think we have missed some opportunities uh, where we might have been a bit firmer. Um, countries like Russia just keep on pushing until they come up against an immobile object, uh, and that is where firmness encounters uh, powers like that. By the way, you see the same with other revisionist powers around the world today as well. Uh, you see it with Iran. There's a need to be firm with Iran. Again, not provocative. Uh, certainly with North Korea. And again, with respect, because they're also our number one trading partner, uh, with China as well. We should certainly accommodate China's legitimate aspirations uh, and firmly and together, collectively, 
uh, perhaps push back uh, at some of those that are not quite so legitimate. I'd like to go to another region of the world, Africa and the Middle East. And I know, Mr. Prime Minister, you have spent a considerable part of your time in this part of the world. Um, we, this year, 2018 of the Global Conference, our concluding session is really to focus on this part of the world, the youngest part of the world, countries where median age is as low as 15, um, projected two, three billion more people, maybe by the end of the century, the entire net growth of the world's population as we look at these charts really occurring in sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. Um, where, where do you see us headed in this area? I know this has been one of your main focuses over the last decade and your interaction uh, with the Crown Prince, whether it's in uh, UAE or the Crown Prince in Saudi Arabia and their views today, this dramatic change that we are seeing where does it lead and what can we do to help it move in the right direction? So I think, Mike, consistent with, with the view that uh, the West should be engaged and pursuing the correct uh, values, I think there are two things, one in respect to the Middle East, one in respect of Africa. In respect to the Middle East, I think it's essential, again, to take a step back and realize that what's happening in the Middle East is a struggle that is really a struggle for societies that are religiously tolerant since the abuse of religion and the politicization of religion, you know, the turning of the religion of Islam into a totalitarian politi political ideology is the great challenge of the region. So religiously tolerant societies and rule-based economies. In other words, economies where if you work hard by your own merits, you can succeed and do well, and where corruption is taken out of the system. Now, I think everywhere you look in the Middle East, there are allies for that cause, of which the new leadership in Saudi Arabia is obviously the most important recent advent. And therefore, you know, my view is, by the way, what's happening particularly in Saudi Arabia, I think it's essential that the Crown Prince succeeds in the reforms yeah. and changes that he's making, because in my view, he, he's the first <clears throat> Saudi leader with this degree of explicitness that I know who understands the link between economic and social reform. In other words, he understands you're not going to get a better economy unless you reform society. And his changes, for example, around women, his changes ar around the abuse of religion and the religion being put in its proper place are absolutely essential. And I would say one other thing, which is the support for the nascent, you know, very much um, quiet at the moment, but with enormous potential, the, the relationship between Israel and the Arab nations is of absolutely fundamental importance. I mean, the state of Israel, I think it's really important this is understood in, in the West, in particular in, in Europe. The security of our countries is hugely enhanced by the state of Israel. And we have to understand its importance in the region and the importance and the need to support it. Now, I hope that we can get a resolution of the Palestinian question. I th think, as I said earlier, the way to resolve it is through that alliance, potentially between the State of Israel and the Arab nations. But basically, what we've got to do is realize that throughout the Middle East, those people who are arguing for religious tolerance and for rule-based economies, these are our allies, and we should get behind them and support them. So that's the first thing. The second thing is in relation to Africa, where I think we need policies of development that recognize we're going to have a huge problem in some of these African countries, particularly those in the Sahel region, where you've got exploding populations, poor governance, high levels of poverty, high levels of radicalization. And we need to watch this and invest in changing that situation now, because otherwise we're going to have a pile of trouble further down the line, both from extremism and from, from waves of migration. So all of this comes back, I think, to the same thing, which is really the theme of what we're saying today. I mean, I'm optimistic about the world if we understand that our future lies and our destiny lies in our own hands. You know, if we understand what has made our country successful and the values that have given rise to this extraordinary 
human progress that is represented by your country and by my country. If we understand that and we're prepared to believe in it and have confidence in it and go out and stand up for it in the world, then I think the right policies flow from that basic position. So I'm optimistic if we do it. I'm obviously pessimistic if we don't. But I think recognizing the challenge and being prepared to meet it is the single biggest thing we can do right now. General? You know, I think I want to just key in and underscore the importance of what the Prime Minister said about Saudi Arabia. Um, someone asked me the other day, so tell us about the transition ongoing in Saudi Arabia. I said, this is not a transition. This is four revolutions. There's a revolution in governance, all power consolidated in the hands of one man. You may question that. But he justifies that because of the need for the second revolution, which is economic uh, has to transform. They have to diversify the economy. Uh, and he is determined to do that. And he realizes that only if he can do away with the old bureaucratic and endless discussions uh, and make decisions can they get on with that. To facilitate that, the third revolution, that's the social uh, ch changes that are being made, and religious. He wants to moderate the form of Islam practiced in the kingdom, where the keeper of the two holy mosques, of course, is king. So this is very, very significant. And then the fourth revolution is a revolution in foreign policy. You know, it used to be said by critics of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia that their foreign policy is to fight to the last American. Uh, you know, <laughs> that they will hold our coat while we go into the ring. Um, and that is not the case. They have determined that they need to strike out on their own. You can question some of the accuracy of some of the campaign and the precision and so forth. Uh, but they are taking all of this on. And again, as the Prime Minister said, we very much need for them to succeed. So today, we are so honored to have two individuals that really shaped our world for the better. And I want to thank you for giving us a guide. And I want to thank both of you again for staying on course to make sure the world you help create is the world we have in the future. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Michael. All right, while we're removing the, uh, the uh, chair, um, I want to just anticipate two things. First, please, you do not have to email, my, e email us if you're from Scandinavia. We do understand that the Norse were probably discovered North America before Columbus did. <laughs> and of course, North America was discovered by people coming from Asia before that. Um, Secondly, for those of you who inquired, no, there is no compensation for those of you in the IBR for frostbite. Okay, while we're uh, going to be, uh, just before we switch to the second part of our program, let me, um, let me just continue a tradition that those of you who have been at the Global Conference before are aware of. And that is, we're going to have a quiz question. So let's, let's put up the question, and I'm going to tell you how to respond. All right, can we put up the slide for the response first, so we can tell people how to do that? OK. I'm going to put up a question, give you some time. And those of you not only in the IBR, but those of you watching uh, through the simulcasts in the other rooms, you text the answer to Global 2018, and then you enter 22333 to join, and then you text in your answer, which will be, you know, like A, B, C, D. Not all four of them, please. Uh, so we're, that's how, what we're going to do. Get used to this, because you'll be seeing more of these as the, uh, over the next few days. And let's put up that first question. And the only question we're going to ask today. Now, this question is that there are 6,452 companies listed on NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange today. How many companies are operated by private equity companies? Now, before I run through these answers, let me say two things. One, uh, the fact that Mike gave an answer to this question is evidence of the fact that we have not coordinated what we're doing with each other. And two, 
I am not telling you that what he gave was exactly the right answer, <laughs> or even close to the right answer. So the choices are A, 4,590, B, 5,175, C, 6,125, D, 7,580, and E, 8,905. So those are your four choices. Let's once again just show how to respond if we can put that slide up. Showing how to text the answers. There we go. You text to Global 2018, enter 22333 to join, and then in this case, you put in A, B, C, D, E. I'm going to give you at your tables a minute to talk about it among yourselves if you want, and then we're going to ask you to send it in. So let's put the question back up on the board. All right. Let's put up the question for a minute before we, we do that so that people have the, the choices again. And let's, uh, let's see where we go with that. All right, let's see how we're doing. All right. All right, this tells us how you're voting. We're going to give you another minute to keep votes in. We feel that it's appropriate to know how your peers are doing, but you don't have to agree with them. All right, you got about 10 seconds more to get them in. All right, we're going to stop it here. And obviously, a majority, well, of you thought that it's E8905, and the actual number is 7,580. All right, you, you, you should know that if Mike's giving an answer, he usually rounds up slightly instead of down. All right, with that, and that important question, because it does talk about the changing equity and capital markets and the financial markets we have, it's a good introduction, segue to move into the next part of our lunch. And we're honored to have with us the Secretary of the Treasury, Steve Mnuchin, who is going to be interviewed by the inimitable Maria Bartiromo. Hi, everyone. Great to see you. Secretary, great to see you. Thank you, Maria. It's Thank great you. to be here with you. Thank you for sitting down with and us. All my LA friends. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I thought we'd start by continuing the discussion on foreign policy because, wow, what a year you have had. Not just tax reform, not just rolling back of regulations and a stabilization and growth in the economy, but North Korea and South Korea meeting, declaring they want to end the war between them and pursue peace. How did that come about? Well, it's, it's historical. I mean, I really think uh, we're looking forward to President Trump's meeting. I think we have high expectations. But uh, the president is determined that North Korea will give up their nuclear weapons. And this has been a major issue of his from the time he got into office. Uh, he, we put on a maximum pressure campaign, which a major component of that was sanctions. These economic sanctions really do work. Uh, China was very helpful with us, working with us on this, and uh, there's no question in my mind that the reason why he is willing to negotiate is the sanctions, and we will not take off the sanctions until we are convinced and can verify that he will give up his nuclear weapons. But it is a historic event to think that uh, earlier in the year we had nuclear tests and we had missiles being shot over. Japan, and now we're at the point where they're, they're talking about a serious peace and, and ending the war. You've been working on sanctions along with everything else, I know that. Tell us what these sanctions are exactly. W what is it limiting? Why did North Korea feel the pressure? Because it was also China, is right, and, and the threat and the pressure campaign against China to help. Correct. Well, the economic sanctions are, are very, very powerful tools. And we have to be careful how we use them because they're very powerful. There's, there's two types of, of sanctions. There's what's called primary sanctions and secondary sanctions. 
In the case of primary sanctions, we designate certain individuals or certain companies, and U.S. persons or anybody uh, are prohibited from dealing with them, transacting dollar business. Secondary sanctions are even stronger. What secondary sanctions say that no, no one can transact dollar business with that individual. So in the case of Iran, we had both primary and secondary sanctions. Uh, the President is obviously looking at the JCPOA and considering whether he'll sign the waiver or not. If he doesn't, the secondary sanctions will go back into place, and that means that uh, European banks, anybody who's transacting in dollars, cannot do business with the designated uh, companies. And that would be important because if we were to pull out or not renew the Iran deal, as you say, the deadline's May 12th, um, they may want to retaliate in some way, but it will be hard when they can't transact money. Well, I, I, think, uh, I think there's a strong belief uh, on everybody that Iran should not have nuclear weapons. They shouldn't have them now. They shouldn't have them in five years. They shouldn't have them in 25 years. Um, the sanctions worked. The, the reason why Iran came to the table and was willing to negotiate is because all the sanctions were in place. Unfortunately, there's three major flaws in the deal. One is the term of the deal. The, the other is the, the uh, ballistic missiles, which they continue to do. And the third part is their activities with terrorism outside of the, the deal. And that's something that uh, now Secretary Pompeo and others are working with our European allies on. Given the fact that much of the activity moves through the central bank of Iran, um, are you poised to sanction the central bank? Um, it, it, again, it's, it's not necessarily the central bank. I mean, anything that would go through the central bank on designated entities, but it's really stopping the money from getting to Iran. Okay. Uh, let me go back to North Korea and China. This is an important situation, an important moment in time. You're headed to China this week. I am indeed. Um, what are you looking to accomplish? Um, we are looking to uh, change the discussion on trade. We're looking to have a very frank discussion. I think the good news is uh, for over the last year, President Trump and President Xi have developed a very close relationship. From the first meeting at Mar-a-Lago, President Trump was very clear that a major issue was the trade imbalance, that we wanted to have reciprocal trade, that our markets are open for China for investments, for trade. Their markets are closed to us. As a result of that, uh, we buy over 500 billion of goods from them. They only buy 135 billion of goods from us. And, and we are looking to create a level playing field for U.S. companies and U.S. workers. We're also very concerned about force transfers of technology, force joint ventures. So these are all the issues we'll be discussing. Because they could come to America, acquire American companies, get involved in private equity deals, or venture capital deals, really, and then transfer that technology to the Chinese and then beat us at our own game in some of the most important industries like AI and robotics. Well, they, they, that's part of the issue. I think the other part of the issue is uh, requiring U.S. companies that come there to do business and entering into joint ventures. Okay. So uh, you'll, you'll be there next week and obviously... This week. This week, you know, Thursday and Friday, Thursday right? and Friday. You'll be there Thursday and Friday. Exactly. Okay. Let, let me move on to the, to the economy right now. Um, things have gotten better. How would you characterize it? Um, you know, since we came into office, the President has made very clear that the economic agenda is the most important agenda focused on creating sustained 3% or higher GDP growth. Lots of economists, when we came into office, said that the U.S. economy can't grow at more than 2% rates, given the size and aging of it. We didn't agree with that. Uh, the tax plan was a major component of creating economic growth, uh, getting competitive tax rates for both corporations and small businesses. We have the lowest small business rates since the 1930s, and changing from a worldwide system to a territorial system. So we're seeing a lot of money now being invested in the U.S., and we're seeing the impact on that on the economy. Wow, that, that, that drop in rates for small business was really powerful. And of course, going for the larger companies from 40 percent to 21 percent has to be a really big deal. That's why we've seen business uh, spending pick up. Correct. Is that Th 35 to 21, but it's still a big deal. But when you show local taxes, yes. it's close to 40 percent. Correct. Um, so that's why you've seen um, an increase in business spending. Where specifically are you seeing the spending increase? 
Um, re really across the board, but the other major component is the fact that people could automatically expense uh, capital investment is also a, a very, also a very big deal in terms of growth in the economy. And uh, we're beginning to see wages increase. That was a major component of this. Uh, we appreciate, you know, several hundred companies who have announced special bonuses for literally millions of workers. Mm, meanwhile, uh, we see this pushback on the tax plan from the skeptics saying it's not going to pay for themselves, the tax cuts. And number two, we are looking at, in the next couple of years, a slowdown. Some people are expecting a recession in 2020. You say? Don't buy that at all. I, I think, uh, again, we see very strong economic growth for the next several years. And in regards to the tax plan paying for itself, if we do get the economic growth, by definition, it will pay for itself. The difference between 2% and 3% GDP is trillions of dollars of revenue to the government. Okay, so the, the tax plan has a long runway then in terms of impacting economic growth in your view? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What about the consumer? That seems to be one of the weak spots. Yes, businesses has started animal spirits. I see it. I, I totally understand what you're saying. You're seeing investment in R&D, investment in IT. But the consumer, slowest pace of consumer spending in five years based on the last GDP report. I think it's one quarter. I think you can't read too much into one quarter. I think the good news is that the consumer balance sheet is much stronger, and uh, I don't expect to see a slowdown. So it doesn't bother you if consumers save before they spend, because the savings rate has gone up. Not at all. Uh, and I, Actually, that would be, to a certain extent, a, a good thing. That's what you want to happen. That would, that would be a good thing. In terms of business, is business reacting the way you want it? Yes, we've got all of those bonuses. But they're buying back a lot of stock, uh, not necessarily hiring all of the, the people that perhaps we thought. Is that a fair statement? No. Okay. So uh, <laughs> the, the one thing I know this crowd gets, okay, and I said to you on, on your show when we did it uh, this morning, stock buybacks are a mechanism that companies can return capital to shareholders. You can have dividends, you can have share buybacks. There are two ways to return capital. If a company has excess capital, they return that capital to shareholders. This group recycles that capital through the economy. It, it doesn't disappear. So there's nothing wrong with stock buybacks. Um, that's not a bad thing. In many times, that's a capital allocation of what companies do. But there are lots of companies that are raising capital. There's lots of companies that are using capital for acquisitions. We're seeing a lot of activity in corporate America. What about the, the idea that we've been on this recovery, rebound, uh, bull run for a lot of years, and some people feel that, you know, things get older. It's aged now. And so after 10 years, you would expect things to slow down. Does that not concern you? Two, two different issues. I mean, for the last eight years, uh, the financial markets have done extremely well. The financial markets have recovered. Corporate earnings have done very well. For the average worker, their wages have not gone up. So again, I think GDP has been too low. GDP has been at, at, at its, its lowest level coming into the last year. So we haven't seen the economic recovery in the real economy that we would have expected, although we have seen tremendous increase in corporate earnings. What would be the metrics that are most important to look at in terms of uh, the, the market getting too tight? You know, oftentimes you speak with uh, money man uh, managers of businesses and they say, things are getting tight. Wages are beginning to go up. I can't find the people that I need to put into the jobs. And so maybe we are looking at the beginning of inflation. Well, we do want some, we do want some wage growth. And you know, the Fed has been targeting inflation. They've been far targeting 2%. So a little bit of inflation is not a problem. A little bit of inflation is a good thing. I don't see anything on the horizon to expect lots of inflation. Uh, energy prices uh, you know, look like they have much more ability to come down as opposed to going up. You also see the fact that we're going to be energy independent in the United States. You look at the amount of liquid natural gas that we have. Th these are all very, very good signs for the economy. These are also job creators in the energy business. Uh, they are. And you know, when you talk about the unemployment rate, I would just say you should look at two different things. You should look at, one, the stated unemployment rate, but you also have to look at the participation rate. So we are at historically low levels of unemployment. I would expect it's, it's going to go even lower. But we're hoping that the participation rate goes up. 
So there's a lot of people who have left the workforce that are no longer looking for jobs that aren't being counted. We hope that through training programs and demand, those people come back into the workforce. That's another priority for this administration, the training programs. It is. Tell us about it. Well, I I again, I think, uh, you know, kind of having proper job training, particularly as the economy changes, uh, th this is very, very important. And for many people, a liberal arts college is a great thing. But for many people, getting, getting training for specific jobs uh, is also a very good thing. So what do you say to managers when they say, and I'm sure you've heard it, I've heard it a lot, I can't find the people to put in the jobs that I have available. Is that about training? Uh, I, I think some of it is training, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not hearing that from the companies I speak to. You're not, okay, because a number of, of managers have told me they, we need more workers. Um, you don't hear that? Uh, I, I, I don't, not at this point. Where is the growth right now in the economy? Can you identify the sectors that you're seeing the most growth? I think we're seeing it across the board. I mean, I think the, the, the only area that you're not seeing growth in is obviously traditional retail is still having a lot of problems as that transforms with e-commerce. But I think you're seeing tremendous growth. And, uh, you know, as I just came back from Europe, you're seeing a lot of international companies that are going to now build manufacturing in the United States, invest in the United States, acquire companies in the United States as a result of the tax change. I mean, I think this is a very big deal. We, we used to tax U.S. companies on worldwide earnings. Uh, all, now we have a very, very competitive tax system with Europe. Yeah, for sure. Uh, when you look out the next few years, you think we can see sustained 3% growth? Is that what Absolutely. you said a, a few minutes ago? Okay. Let me, let me ask you about uh, really why this market gets so nervous. I mean, obviously, when you have an economy doing better, you see economic growth picking up, you see interest rates picking up, you see inflation a little bit coming up, and yet people get so nervous about 3% on the 10-year. Does that, does that surprise you that we, we, we hit 3% and the market sells off? Well, I mean, you know, as, I, as I've said, look, uh, wh where the market is at any given day, uh, I'm focused on where the market is six months, a year from now, five years from now, and uh, I see tremendous opportunities for U.S. companies. As it relates to interest rates, and uh, I want to be careful because I do respect the Fed's independence on interest rates, um, part of it is, one, the market expects interest rates to go up. So if you look at the forward curve, the market expects that. It's a question of how fast and how far do they go up. And I think a lot of that depends on inflation and how the economy does. Mm -hmm. So to a certain extent, part of the reason why you have interest rates going up is because the economy is doing better, and th that's a good thing. Some people say that the biggest risk to the economy right now, frankly, is the Federal Reserve. Because if they view this economy as getting too strong and raise interest rates too many times, we could actually send, they could send the economy into recession. Well, I would just say I have a lot of, a lot of confidence in Chair Powell. I think he's uh, terrific leadership in this job and our other new appointees. Uh, Randy Quarles on the regulatory side. So uh, again, you know, the Fed will do what they'll do. They're independent, but I think we have great leadership there. And they understand these issues and they'll look at this as the, as the economy continues. Are you gonna do a phase two tax cut plan? We would like to do that. What would be the priorities? Priorities would be to make the middle income tax cuts permanent. And anything on the business side that you I want to... I think the business side we're pretty happy with. There's a bunch of things we need to do in a technical correction bill, which uh, e even things that were obvious drafting mistakes right now, the Democrats just don't want to fix. Um, there's a lot of issues that we can deal with through regulations at the IRS and the Office of Tax Policy, but there, there are a few still minor drafting issues that we would want to clear up. Would that be a priority for this year, doing phase two tax? Um, you know, I, I think it's something we'll look at later this year. Okay, perhaps I, I after the I, I don't expect we're going to get anything before the midterms. Got it, okay. L let me ask you about trade. Uh, obviously, this is an area that Royals markets. The president knows that, right? He does. Okay, <laughs> just checking. He watches the markets, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, tomorrow is the deadline for uh, the exemptions to uh, go away for... European nations, Australia, uh, several others, all, all including about half of the U.S. imports uh, of steel. Will the president extend the exemptions? Well, uh, I will tell you, I just left a uh, secure video teleconference call with the president and the entire economic team, but uh, I am not going to broadcast the president's decision, but we look forward to it. Okay. Um, Macron was at the White House last week. 
Merkel was at the White House last week. You have to believe that they want some answers and they want a fair situation as well. Why should they get hit with 25% tariff on steel when they're really not, it's just going through Europe, right? It's really coming from China. Has the European countries become collateral damage in this debate with China? Not, not necessarily. This, I mean, there is a lot of steel coming out of China and there is overcapacity, but there is steel that is manufactured in other places in the world as well. The president's objective is to make sure that we, we save our steel business, that we do that carefully. But uh, again, I, I can tell you, I have been, I just came back from, from Paris. Uh, last week I had the, all the G20 finance ministers in Washington, D.C. for the IMF and World Bank meetings. We've been in constant discussions on this, and the entire economic team within the administration speaks every day. So we've, we've, we've been discussing and we've been having conversations with lots of third-party countries. So it's not a hostile thing. You're having discussions about trying to make things more balanced and fair. Negotiations. <laughs> okay. What about NAFTA? A lot of conversation recently that we could see a deal before the Mexico elections. Do you believe that to be true? Um, we're busy trying to get a deal with NAFTA. We're in active discussions with the Canadians and the Mexicans. Uh, again, I'm cautiously optimistic on that. Uh, again, I think we have a short window left to get this done. Otherwise, we are going to have to put it on hold till after the elections. But uh, you know, our, our objective is to refine NAFTA. It's an old deal to fix it. Um, the good news is we have lots of two-way trade with Mexico and Canada. Our objective is to increase that, create more opportunities for U.S. companies, and do it on a fair and level playing field. Mm. More opportunities being what? what? What would be success for this president and for yourself in terms of crafting a new deal, let's call it first on, on tariffs, aluminum and steel? Uh, what, what would be success? Well, aluminum and steel is a different issue. So, I mean, just to be clear, that, that, that's about you know, what's of strategic importance to the United States to maintain the aluminum and steel industry here and not being completely dependent upon foreign steel. Th that's completely different than what we're trying to do with NAFTA, what we're trying to do with the EU, what we're trying to do with China is more about free and fair balanced trade. As I said, the United States is the most open market in the world other than CFIUS, which uh, I chair, which is the Committee on Foreign Investment. I'm sure a bunch of people in the room know about that. We only turn down deals for national security reasons. Um, you know, we just want to make sure, again, our companies have the same opportunities abroad, and we haven't. Has CFIUS become more aggressive in that regard? Obviously, uh, it stopped and blocked the deal between Qualcomm and Broadcom. It did. Why? What was national security I, 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 I can't go into the specifics of that, Maria, okay. unfortunately. But again, I can tell you, uh, the good thing about the committee is all the major agencies in the government are on it. Uh, we have we have big teams that review these things extensively, and we review these issues very, very carefully. And, and, and we should point out that Broadcom is a Singapore-based company, right? The, the, the parent company, so. Uh, I'm not, not going to comment on the, any of the reasons Any why specific we did that. deals, gotcha, okay. In, in terms of the broad outlook for trade, do you think that impacts economic growth? We've got a very rosy scenario here in terms of the tax plan impact, the re regulation impact, but the trade story is what roils market. So I wonder if this uncertainty continues for an extended period of time, does that cut into the expectations in terms of your forecasts for growth? Well, Maria, you know, I would go back to the North Korea story. You know, six months ago, people were concerned that the president was being too aggressive in dealing with North Korea. North Korea is now at the negotiating table. So if, if you want to get new deals, and whether that's on trade or other things, you have to be prepared to have serious negotiations and move forward. And if people know that you're not going to do anything, they're not going to negotiate. Mm. And, and, and that's the reason I started the conversation with North Korea, because it is quite extraordinary. And, this, and it's not just the tough talk or the president's rhetoric. There were real issues put on the table between the U.S. and China pushing back on North Korea, which brought him to the table. Uh, absolutely. And not, not just the U.S. and China. I mean, it was... You know, many other countries as well. Europe was very helpful in this. Um, many other countries were very helpful. Secretary, I've got to bring up spending, and I've got to bring up trillion-dollar deficits, which now we're all expecting for several years out. Should we worry about that? Well, I hope we don't have trillion-dollar deficits for several years out. But uh, look, what I would say is this. The president 
was determined to increase military spending. We had cut back military spending significantly and underinvested in the military. And uh, I, I will tell you, you know, now being in the government, uh, I just have tremendous respect for the men and women in the military and what they do every day to defend our country all over the world. So if you, if, you, if you look at the President's original budget, it was a significant increase in military spending offset by significant cuts across the board in other things. And there were hard decisions, but the President was determined that we would have a balanced budget. Unfortunately, that went nowhere. Unfortunately, in Congress, I think, as you know, you need 60 votes in the Senate. And the Democrats were very clear. They demanded you know, what started out as one-for-one one increases. We got slightly less than that, but uh, as the President said, when, when the bill got to him, he signed it, but he wasn't happy about all the increased spending in non-military spending. And that's something we're going to have to be dealing with over time. Does he regret not just letting the government shut down over this issue? Uh, I don't think he regrets that because, again, I think it was very important to him to get the military spending. Uh, that's something that uh, Secretary Mattis and other went through, and I think that's a very big investment that was needed for this country. But as you know, he's looking at, uh, you know, I, I talked about the line item veto, and you can't exactly have a line item veto constitutionally, but what you can have is you can have a mechanism where the President can delay spending on certain items, send it back to Congress, for a thumbs up or a thumbs down vote. I mean, we need to figure out over time how we figure out a better mechanism to deal with spending. And, and just to be clear, you don't see trillion dollar deficits for several years out? Uh, I, I said I hope we don't have okay. trillion dollar deficits for several years out. Um, the President over the weekend said, look, if there's not money in the next budget, which the deadline is September, um, right before the midterm elections, then we will shut the government down. You agree with that? I would take him very seriously that he's going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, it's odd to hear that because you're right before the midterm elections, and it could be quite disruptive in terms of the vote. Could be. It, but, it is uh, what it is, is what you're saying. It, it is. Yeah. Um, what are you going to do about the resist constant? I mean, here you are trying to put a budget. This is a $47 trillion budget. You're telling me you couldn't come up, not you, but the group couldn't come up with $25 billion for the president's wall I think in the $47 trillion cl budget? Cl clearly, if the Democrats had wanted to. And again, it's, it's not just the wall. It's part of all of border security. So the president didn't want just money for the wall. He wanted money for what's very important border security right. issues. I understand. And by the way, I would also, you know, the president was willing to sit down and negotiate DACA, and that's something that, again, the, the Democrats didn't want to come to the table on, except on their terms. So my question really is, how are you going to deal with this going forward? I mean, obviously, you're, you're dealing with it. It is what it is. But you've got a pushback on this president's policies at every turn. Um, and here you have, you know, the spending omnibus that, you know, broke the bank, and a lot of people were upset about it. And the president just signed it because he needed the military spending and he wanted to do that. But is there a plan to push back on the pushback that you constantly receive? Uh, I think there is, Maria. But, you know, I would also just comment on, you know, let's focus on the important achievements, which the tax plan has been a very, very important achievement. You look at the foreign policy issues, again, whether it's North Korea, whether it's, you know, what's going on in, in, in other areas, the Middle East. I think that uh, we're very focused on working with all of our allies on the issues of Iran and the concerns. And, you know, I think that uh, for the first time you, you have the potential, and I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I think there is the potential for peace in the Middle East in the next few years. That is just extraordinary, Secretary. Let me ask you about the rollback in regulations, because that also was a real game changer, certainly for a number of industries. Financial services didn't really have the impact that some others did, but now we're talking about some changes and tweaks in the Dodd-Frank legislation. How would you like that to change? Um, look, I, 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 th I think it's very important. I think that uh, you have a bill that's passed the Senate that I think makes a lot of very, very significant changes to Dodd-Frank. We're a long time past the financial crisis. This is fixing it, particularly for uh, small commercial banks, uh, community banks, 
medium-sized banks. I think there's a lot of important changes. I know that uh, Chairman Henseling and I, uh, he's here, I don't know if he's in the audience, but we spoke yesterday at lunch. I know he's working on that in the House, and uh, I look forward to him working with his committee and, and getting this passed. This is very important legislation. And I also just comment, I mean, the good news is this is bipartisan legislation. So uh, I think this is very important to regulatory reform and financial services. Um, we've done a lot of work uh, at FSOC on financial regulation. I think there's a lot of things that the regulators can do. Um, as I mentioned, Randy Quarles at the Fed, uh, Joseph Odding at the OCC, and, and others working with us at, at FSOC. Uh, I think there's a lot of good work that's been done. So do you think we will see a change to Dodd-Frank this year, or is that a next year thing? No, this should get done now. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm hopeful this gets done in the next 30 to 60 days. You, you, you seem very optimistic about where things are going. Uh, I am. Did I miss anything, Mr. Secretary, in terms of the nuts and bolts of where we are in terms of growth and economic activity right now? Maria, I think you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get to the fun stuff. How was the state dinner? State dinner was great. Yeah? But I'll tell you what was even better than the state dinner the arrival ceremony. I mean, that was really impressive. You had the entire military guard and everything. It was really, and both President Trump and President Macron both gave both great speeches. But the, the state dinner was nice because it was small. It was actually only about 130 people, and it was uh, very intimate. And if I, didn't, uh, if I didn't have enough of the French, I then flew to Paris the next day <laughs> for an important terrorist financing conference where we had uh, over 300 people there. Again, you know, Sanctions, terrorist, combating terrorist financing, very, very important work that we're doing. Uh, the first time we launched the Terrorist Financing Center in Saudi last summer, working with all the Arab countries. So these are, these are very, very important tools to stop bad people. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll end on, on what I, where I was going with the state dinner, but, but let's stay there for a second in Saudi Arabia. I saw you in Riyadh last October when you opened that, and, and I thought that was incredible, and it is incredible what's happening under MBS, as we just heard from General Petraeus and, and Tony Blair and Michael Milken. Your reaction, do you believe that they will actually see fundamental structural change in Saudi Arabia? I, I really do. I, I think it's incredible what MBS is doing under his leadership. And now we have Davos in the desert in Saudi. <laughs> we have Davos, and now we have, I think this is dubbed like Davos in the palm trees or something or right. other. I mean, so, so that meeting with President Macron last week, the President and, and President Macron are very touchy-feely. Uh, I think they, I, w I won't comment on that. I'm not they, going to. They really there. like each other. But I will say, I think they've developed a very, a very good relationship. And, uh, you know, look, I give President Macron a lot of credit for what he's trying to do in Europe. I think that uh, he's trying to bring things together. And uh, I think those are very important issues. And as he said on the, you know, on the Iran deal, he acknowledges a lot of the things that President Trump has been talking about with shortcomings in the deal. And I would also just say, you know, the French and UK were terrific partners in working with us on Syria. Um, you know, these things always look a lot easier when you see them on TV. A lot of planning that goes into this, a lot of execution, and uh, again, I think we, we can't sit back and watch people using chemical weapons. And I imagine that also creates some goodwill when it comes to other issues like trade. Yes. <laughs> Secretary Mnuchin, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.